As you can see, I have set up a demonstration here, the objective of which is to look at diffraction patterns. The analogy here is going to be, right now, we're using light. This is a green laser. Uh, it is 522 to 542 nanometers. Now, for that purpose, we can look at structures that are going to be, let's see if I slide all this in here to the video frame better. We're going to be looking at structures that are going to be of the similar size and wavelength of uh, the light. Now, the analogy here that I'd like to use is for looking at atomic and molecular spacings. How big is a molecule approximately? How big is a covalent bond? Picometers? Uh, it's actually a few hundred picometers. Oh, and that's what it's called? It'll be on the order of angstroms. So fractions of, angst fractions of nanometers. So a molecule as a rough ballpark is about a nanometer, but it all, of course, depends. Molecules vary widely in size. You know, about one, one to two angstroms is going to be your standard covalent bond length. So we would need to use light or radiation that's of similar length scale. And that would be what for photons? It would be x-rays. Now, it would, it would actually be uh, actually hard or soft x-rays could work. Uh, for neutrons, neutrons are a particle, of course, but all particles have particle wave duality. So with neutrons, the example here is not necessarily, uh, it's more so what's the energy of the particle, what's the temperature of the particle. So for neutrons, in order to get on the order of a couple of angstroms wavelength, you need to cool it down to below 10 degrees Kelvin. Once you cool it down that, that cold, then you can actually start to see the wave-like characteristics, and the energy of the neutron is going to be such that it's going to be of a similar order of magnitude to an X-ray. Uh, in terms of the wavelength. So the first question I have is why does diffraction occur? Like what is, what is special about light that makes diffraction occur? Who has done, who's used a microscope before? Hopefully most everyone has looked under a microscope. If not, hop down to my lab, we'll look at some stuff under a microscope, it's kind of neat. Uh, what is the minimum size of particle that we can observe under a microscope? light microscope, optical microscopy, optical transmission microscopy, to be a little bit more specific. Micro Smaller than that. What was the wavelength of my laser that I'm using? Effectively, yeah, that would be the absolute minimum. What's the wavelength of the lowest frequent, highest frequency of light that we can observe, which would be on the order of about 400 nanometers. So by optical microscopy, is about 500 nanometers. Now the principle behind how optical microscopy works is it takes advantage of the difference in transmission of light going through the system. So presumably you're in water or some sort of a solvent environment which is going to be optically clear. Now in those circumstances, the light from the light source zips on by and can be observed by your eye looking through the magnification eyepiece. The light that hits an object will either be blocked and absorbed by that object itself, or it'll slow down. And this is actually a technique that Professor Zangle uses to measure the mass of cells. Right? So this is actually a really neat technique, where as you go through an object, right, the refractive index is the ratio of the speed of light in the object relative to the speed of light in vacuum. So using that information, you can see that the, if the light here is at the same phase, this one will probably slow down a little bit, right? Actually, I don't know how to draw slow down wavelengths. Uh, but anyway, it'll be out of phase when it leaves the object. And by the change in phase, you can understand how much material that light has gone through. And then, of course, over here, it becomes unobstructed. Now, what happens when my particle, in this case here, my particle is, let's say, greater than 500 nanometers. There's nothing wrong with the optics. I can zoom in as much as I physically want to on this object. But the problem is the image starts to get fuzzy. So I'm dealing with a smaller particle, 
which I drew a little smaller here, and let's say this is on less than 500 nanometers in size. So what happens is maybe at the center, yeah, it'll still be blocked. The photon will be blocked completely. But what ends up happening is that the light will sort of diffract around the edges. The net result is that if I were to look down on this object here, I would see the object itself, and then it would start to get fuzzy around the edges. So the boundary between the solvent and the object itself would start to get fuzzier and fuzzier and fuzzier. So I could zoom in, right, but I would be zooming in on a fuzzy image. This is when we're reaching the diffraction limit of light itself. Now, one of the key questions that I've always had, why does light do this? And the answer to that question is more so, why doesn't light always do this? So, the best explanation that I found, wavelet theory, or more formally, the Huygens, Fresno principle. What this principle basically states is that light always wants to diffract. At every point in space, every single photon at every instant in time is actually scattering always. The only reason why we don't just see light everywhere illuminating everything is because when I have a beam of photons, right? These are the photon waves. This is a plane wave of photons approaching me. At every point in space, this photon is actually scattering radially, right? Which is the same thing that's happening here, right? The light in this region right here, right? Some of it is passing through. Some of it is scattering. The net result is it looks like it's bending around the corner of the object in the microscope. So according to the Huygens Fresnel, Fresnel principle, what's happening actually is that every point in space, every photon is actually diffracting. But the reason that you don't see it diffracting is because I have another photon right here, and 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 you're actually canceling out all of the light going in every other direction except forward. So all the light in every other direction that's not coming from that approach gets canceled out. So when you take and you send that light through a thin slit, where this slit is on the size length of the wavelength of light, all the light that hits the aperture gets blocked, and the light that goes through, as soon as it gets to this point right here, it doesn't magically know that it's going through a slit. Right? Photons aren't smart. They don't have any sort of intelligence. All that's happening is that now the wave, the photon here and the photon here is physically blocked. It can't cancel out all that diffraction that's happening innately. So then this wave right here will end up diffracting. Exactly the same thing can be observed when you're looking at waves in the ocean, for example. Right, that is the fundamental principle of how uh, diffraction works, particularly for optical microscopy. So to give you an idea, why I like to spend so much time on this. Bragg's Law was discovered and published in 1913. Does anyone want to guess the year that the father and son Bragg pair won the Nobel Prize for their discovery? Nineteen fifteen. William Bragg was 25 years old, is and still is the youngest person to ever receive the Nobel Prize in physics. So we are all, well, maybe not you guys, but I'm well past my prime. Bragg's law has this relationship here. D is the separation distance between crystal planes. So if I have a crystalline object here, there are a number of crystal planes that can be drawn in the object. We have one here, we have one here, we have one 
there, yeah, up here, some of these might be the same, right? But this is the separation distance between atoms in crystal planes. Sine theta corresponds to, if I have a photon entering in here, when it reflects off of a crystal plane, it'll reflect out this way. They define this as angle theta. N is an integer, and lambda is the wavelength of the light that's coming into this object. So as it turns out, how this actually works, though, is a little bit, I think, uh, this seems like some sort of a magic code. It works well for crystal planes, but it doesn't work necessarily well for uh, amorphous or non-crystalline objects, which is what I spend most of my time studying. So the principle that we have to understand is called isotropic scattering. So to reiterate, Bragg's law is the consequence of the physics that I'm going to be discussing right now. Bragg's law is the relationship that exists for well-ordered crystalline phases. Okay. So isotropic scattering occurs when the wavelength of light is much, much greater than the size of the object that is being scattered. So in the case of x-rays, they are scattered by electrons in an atom or a molecule. The wavelength for x-rays is going to be on the order of one angstrom. Now here's a problem. I just told you that the bond in an atom size is going to be on the order of an angstrom. So that means I can't satisfy this criteria. But that's not actually what's happening. The x-rays are scattering based on the Bohr radius. No, sorry, not the Thomson scheme. That's not, not the Bohr radius. Thomson length. Thomson radius. So what this is, this is an effective size of an electron. As it turns out, we don't know how big an electron is. Nobody knows how big an electron is. Because there's no way to actually basically measure length scale at that size. So what we do instead is we use an analogy for what's the effective size of an electron based on how strongly it scatters x-rays. As it turns out, this is 2.8 times 10 to the minus 15 meters, which is 2.8 times 10 to the minus 5 angstroms. Very, very small. Yes? So do they just like vary the wavelength until they end up at that number? Is, there, is that obtained? This number can actually be a function of the wavelength itself. So the energy of the x-ray affects the size of the electron in some cases. Now that's only during like a certain special circumstances. But yes, but this is, this is, what, this is a, all the scattering theory is based a largely on using classical analogies of size, basically. So we're going to use this term cross-section that basically means like what's the effective shadow that's cast by the light being scattered. And basically what we're doing is we're lumping in a lot of complex physics into a simple classical analogy. Does anyone, has anyone we didn't cover it in this class, but kinetic theory of gases, has anyone covered kinetic theory of gases? Anyone heard of what collision cross-sections are for determining rates? This is hopefully something you'll cover in your grad kinetics class. When you have two molecules colliding into one another, right, the effective size of the molecule is what they use to determine whether or not a particular collision has enough energy to cause a chemical reaction to occur. So collision cross-sections is a similar analogy to scattering cross-sections here as well. It's what's the effective size of the particle based on its probability to scatter radiation. Okay. So same, same basic principle for the wavelength of neutrons. They're again going to be on the order of about one angstrom. In fact, these are going to be maybe on the order of two to five. It's going to be a little bit more common. It's going to be hard to get your neutrons this cold. But in this case, the radius of the nucleus is going to be on the order of 1.75 to 15 times 10 to the minus five angstroms. 
So even though the collective atom is quite large, the scattering is coming from, in the case of x-rays, electrons, and in the case of neutrons, the nucleus of the atom itself. And those are very, very small particles, right? They're about 100,000 times smaller than the actual wavelength itself. Now what this does is allows us to use something called the isotropic scattering approximation. And it exactly is the same principle as when we are diffracting through a thin slit. When this slit is much, much smaller than the wavelength of light, this wave that comes out will be a perfect spherical wave. So what happens in diffraction theory, now the, the net consequence of all of this is Bragg's law for a crystal. So we have a incoming photon, let's say for x-rays, we're going to photons. And then here we have a very, very small scattering object. In this case here we have the wavelength of the x-ray, which is much, much, much greater than the radius of, let's say, the electron that we're scattering off of. What this means is that a certain fraction of the x-rays that come into the system are going to be scattered by this electron. And what it does, it'll scatter isotropically and with the same wavelength. So from here to here will be lambda. So we have a peak, trough, peak, trough, peak, trough. Now mathematically how we represent that is that we have a plane wave being converted to a spherical wave, SP. Now what this looks like is we have E to the I, K, Z. In this case, this is the Z direction. This is a plane wave. This is a mathematical formula for a plane wave. If you recall, Euler's formula relates between some com complex EI to combinations of sines and cosines. And what's happening when we scatter, we are going to be creating a spherical wave Right? Again, this is a wave, but in this case, now it's traveling in the R direction, and its amplitude is getting reduced the further away you get from the origin. And we're going to add in an amplitude. We call this the scattering length. And this here is a sphere wave. X-ray comes in <clears throat> as a planar wave. K is the wave number. Check this out a little bit more. Plane wave comes in, traveling in the Z direction with the frequency given by the wave number. There is a certain probability. That probability is the scattering length. The scattering length tells us the probability that this plane wave is going to be scattered and converted into a spherical wave. And then these spherical waves will emanate out from this particular particle itself. Now, when we have a collection of particles, Let's say we have particle of type A, particle of type B, particle of type C. These are going to have corresponding properties. A particle is going to have a probability to scatter given by the scattering length BA. Particle B is going to have a probability to scatter by scattering length B. And particle C is going to have a probability to scatter according to the scattering length C. Now, in the case of x-rays, the more electrons you have in an atom, the higher the probability you have to scatter. With neutrons, it's a little bit different. Neutrons, it depends on the nuclear composition itself. So with neutron scattering, we can substitute hydrogen for deuterium, and they actually scatter completely differently, even though it's roughly the same chemical structure. 
And this is what we can use to determine complex structures in mixtures themselves. So now imagine that every single one of these is having a radial wave scatter out. But the amplitude of each of these radial waves is given by the scattering length of the individual particle itself. Then we surround this with the detector. And we measure the constructive and destructive interference. And that is the basic mathematics of how diffraction theory works. So just to clarify a few things. Um, I'll write out the final formula for how we analyze scattering data. Um, and then we'll go on to our examples. So Euler's equation. Right, so basically, anytime you see e to the i something, just know that that's a combination of cosines and sines. Right, that's how we can relate between waves here. Now, I don't know if anyone's done a lot of trigonometry, but trigonometry sucks. So it's much better to actually do things in terms of a complex uh, frame of reference. So, let's see. Let me skip over to our final relationship here. So our final scattering equation, right? What our detector is measuring is this function here. We are measuring what we call the structure factor. That is S of Q. Let me get a blue marker so I can label what these terms mean. Okay, S of Q is what we call our structure factor. This is our objective and what we measure in a scattering experiment. Q is what we call the scattering vector. Rj is the atomic positions. Bj is the scattering lengths. N is the number of particles. Sigma is what they call the cross section. Sorry, scattering cross section. And omega is the solid angle. Has anyone heard of the term solid angle before? Who has not heard the term solid angle? Quite a few people. So a solid angle, if I'm looking at something, the size of an object that my eye can see isn't dependent on the size of the object at all. It's dependent on how finely I can resolve two angular differences based on separation. That's effectively the concept of a solid angle. So if I have an angle that's expanding out from my eyeball. Two objects can be of different size and still have the same solid angle. So the solid angle is here for an object up close, and the physical size is larger further away. Solid angle is the area encompassed by a sort of outgoing ray of light that I see. So effectively what that means is that if I'm scattering from this particle here, it doesn't matter where I put my detector. I can put my detector here, put my detector here, put my detector here. Even though I'm seeing more or less light being scattered, it's all emanating from the same source, and so it has the same solid angle. It's an, a, sort of an important con concept for, for optics and, and display kind of technologies. Okay, so let me break this equation down very quickly. <clears throat> 
what we're measuring here, the scattering cross-section, you should just think of this as the scattering intensity. How much light is being scattered in a particular direction. Right? That's what this first term is we're talking about here. 1 over n, this is just the normalization. So if I have a big sample size versus a small sample size for diffraction, we typically normalize it with respect to the number of particles. And here, what we're doing is we are adding up all of the waves coming from all of the individual particles, scaling them by their amplitude, which is their scattering length. We have to square this or take the complex conjugate. Right? The reasoning behind that is basic step down to basic physics. We cannot know whether or not an object is positive or negative. So if I have a photon, a photon is an oscillating positive negative electromagnetic field. I can't actually tell the difference between a positive electromagnetic field and a negative electromagnetic field. All I can detect is, is there a photon or is not, there not a photon? So this would be given by the wave, this would be the wave function of that particular one. Now the amplitude, or the probability of finding a particle in a certain position is given by the complex conjugate, which would look like this. Right? There's no probability of finding a photon at the nodes, but there's a high probability of finding a photon at the peaks and troughs. But it doesn't actually matter to me whether or not it's positive or negative. Okay? So this term right here is basically saying, I'm just going to add up all of the different waves emanating from every different point in space. What we care about is this function right here. We want to know where the particles are located. This will allow us then to reverse engineer the scattering pattern to know what type of an object would produce that type of scattering pattern. And to accomplish that, we have some diffraction demonstrations that I hope will work. OK, that is the basic mathematics. Oh, one last thing really quickly. The, diffract, the structure factor is directly related to the radial distribution function. And I will write out that relationship right now, and then we will go on to the fun demonstration here. Now this can be written a number of ways, but the structure factor Now, I don't know if you guys recognize this, but sine of qr integrated from 0 to infinity. Do you know what that's called? It's a Fourier transform. So the structure factor. Fourier transform or the inverse Fourier transform of the radial distribution function. So when we looked at our examples of liquid argon, those are measured by measuring the structure factor experimentally and then simply taking a Fourier transform and that gives us our radial distribution function, which we can then use to understand what's the intermolecular correlation um, between particles. Okay, any questions about the theory?